video series. Developed exclusively for members, this video series features instruction from the game's top players. The very best of the PGA Tour lay out their blueprint for better golf. In this edition, Driving for Distance and Accuracy, Partners Club President Tom Lehman presents his tips for straighter, more powerful drives. Welcome to the Game Improvement video series, developed to improve every part of your golf game from tee to green. Hi again, everybody. I'm Jim Kelly. It's my pleasure to be your host. In this edition, we're going to start with distance and accuracy with the driver. And we have the very best player that could possibly illustrate both power and accuracy. And I think you'll like our choice. The 1996 PGA Tour Player of the Year and Partners Club President, Tom Lehman. There's no changes in energy, there's no changes in speed. So it's just a one, two, three type swing. And when you get that kind of thing going, you can hit a ball very, very straight. In our first segment, Tom lays out some of the important fundamentals that keep him on top of his game. Next, Tom covers key points to help members improve accuracy with the driver. And once we've got the ball going straighter, he'll show you how to get more distance. Finally, Tom shares his insights for making your best swing while under pressure. Now, we know that our members are pretty good golfers, so we're not going to spend a lot of time on the basics. Yes, we will touch, though, on the fundamentals, but mostly, well, we'll concentrate on some specific techniques that many of the best players in the world use to their advantage. And to help you incorporate their tips into your golf game, we'll also provide practice drills that can help pound these techniques into your muscle memory. And for those practice drills, we'll travel to South Florida and meet Martin Hall, former lead instructor at the Jim Flick Golf School and currently director of instruction at Ibis Golf and Country Club. Martin has developed practice drills that will help you incorporate Tom's instruction into your game. Should stay as one tone. But first, let's look at the career of Tom Lehman and the importance driving has played in his ascension to the top of the PGA Tour. Although Tom Lehman turned professional in 1982, it took 12 up and down years before he won his first PGA Tour event, the 94 Memorial Tournament. One thing about me is that I've never been able to give up on something until I've done my very best at it. Tom continued to build momentum with a victory at the 95 MasterCard Colonial. Yet Tom's long climb from mini tours towards success had only just begun. I just feel like I've been improving each year as I've gone along. And, uh, and so it may seem, I guess, to the, the outsider, like, you know, this guy's kind of just come out of nowhere. Uh, to me, it just seems like it's been a long, long, slow process. Persistence paid off for Tom. And in 96, a victory at the British Open propelled him into golf history, forever ranking him among the major championship winners. Now, there's times when I start thinking about it and I go, wow, you know, I, I really did win the British Open. That's, you know, something that they can never, ever take away from you. Uh, you can never, ever take out the record books that you've won a major championship. A dominating victory at the season-ending Tour Championship capped off a tremendous season. Not only did Tom Lehman win Player of the Year honors, but also the Arnold Palmer Award for leading money winner and the Varden Trophy for lowest scoring average. A large factor in Tom's successful climb hinged on his improvement between the 80s and 90s, particularly in his ability to drive the golf ball. Between the first six years and the last six years of his golfing career, Tom increased not only in length, but also in accuracy. And with one major championship under his belt, you can bet he'll be driving for more. Obviously, Tom has rounded out his entire game, but the drastic improvements he's made with the big stick and the impact on his overall confidence cannot be denied. And neither will Tom Lehman. You know, when you hear someone say fundamental instruction, what comes to mind? Grip, stance, ball position, and so forth. And the proper technique for each, right? Well, what might be good basics for you may not be good for another player. So members, let's begin with the fundamentals and clear up any confusion about the grip. If you were standing far away from, say, Arnold Palmer hitting a tee shot, would you recognize him by a swing? Of course you would. And what does that tell us? 
it tells us that even though there are certain things that must happen in the golf swing to hit the ball well, there's still an element of individual style. It's up to you to determine what it is that I do that can help your game too. But let's start at the beginning with the basics. Most problems off the tee begin before you address the ball. And the first thing really is the grip. Everybody talks about how you have to have the perfect grip. And again, because of individual styles, I tend to disagree with that. Paul Azinger has a very strong grip. He's kind of like this. Johnny Miller is very weak. He's way over to the left like this. To ask Johnny to grip it like Paul and Paul to grip it like Johnny would cause both guys to shoot in the 80s, I'm sure. And the point is, is that their grips match their swing, or their swing matches their grip, however you want to look at it. But neither guy has a classic grip, and neither do I. I have a real long thumb and a strong right hand. You can see my thumb in the V of my right hand. You know, and I developed that because I needed to get more length with my backswing. I grew up with a very short thumb, and I was very short with my backswing. And the longer my thumb got, the longer my backswing got. So I got my thumb going longer down the shaft so I could get a longer backswing. And now Martin Hall has a few drills to help members customize their grip. Tom Lehman mentioned two special players, Paul Azinger and Johnny Miller. Great players they are. Very different ways to hold the golf club, very different styles. I'd like to just elaborate on that a little bit. Paul Azinger grew up and his coach, John Redman, encouraged him to have a grip in which his hands were turned well to the right of the shaft. Now to illustrate this, I'm going to take two tees, put them between my thumb and forefinger, and give you what we call here the Paul Azinger grip. Now that's hands turned well to the right of the shaft. And Paul Azinger, PGA champion, tour winner, great player. Important to understand if you have a Paul Azinger grip, then what you need as you swing through is what we might call a Paul Azinger release. Hands turned to the right in the setup means that you must feel the club faces up as you swing through. Some people call that a reverse roll. Paul actually thinks of keeping his knuckles up to the sky. So if you have your hands turned to the right, the compatible release is to feel that you hold the club face under. Now Johnny Miller was quite different. He was at the other end of the spectrum. Johnny Miller had a position of his hands where those two tees would have been straight down the shaft, perhaps even a touch to the left of the shaft. Now, that's been called over the years, that's been called a weak grip. Now here's the point, if you have a Johnny Miller grip, you better have a Johnny Miller release. Hands turned slight to the left means that you've got to have lots of rotation through the ball. Now that's compatible with a Johnny Miller grip. Now the point here is, you cannot be Paul Miller or Johnny Azinger. Don't have Johnny Miller's grip with Paul Azinger's release. You will hit wild slices to the right. Don't have Paul Azinger's grip with Johnny Miller's release. You would hit wild duck hooks to the left. Got to be aware of these things. My preference for position on how you place the hands, I like to think as I look at my club head, there's a clock face in front of me. I think that that's 12 o'clock. I like my left hand to be turned so that that T points to about one o'clock. That's sort of a bit of an anti-slice grip. I mean, that's my miss. I tend to leak it off to the right. So I have a bit of an anti-slice grip. If you slice the ball, you probably want to have what I call that, that 130 grip. And that has a really very beneficial effect on getting the club to turn over and take the slice out of it. Did you know that squeezing the life out of your club could be the death of your game? The grips are very, very individual. It's up to you, it's gotta fit your swing. But the one thing that you, you must do is have the right grip pressure. Most people that I see playing golf that play poorly choke the club. They get so much tension in their arms and shoulders because they just choke the club, they grip it so hard, there is so much tension and anxiety that they can't play. I'm just gonna tell you right now, you need to hold the club just hard enough to maintain control of the club head, and that's it. So a very gentle grip, almost like you're caressing the club, that's the right grip pressure, and I guarantee you'll play better. Now, Martin Hall with a couple of drills that will help ensure proper grip pressure. I've taught golf in 14 different countries, 
and of all the people I've taught, almost all of them hold the club too tightly and have too much tension in their arms. Two drills you should try at home here that will alleviate that problem. First one Tom Watson gave me, doing a clinic with Tom at Pebble Beach, and he said when he gets tight, he can't feel the weight of the club head, and so this is how he goes about rectifying that situation. He turns the club the wrong way up and makes about 10 or 12 swings back and forth and back and forth. Obviously, you can't feel the weight of the club head here because there isn't one. And then what he'll do, having made about 10, 15 swings there, is turn the club the right way up and go ahead and swing. Now, if your grip pressure is light enough, you will be able to feel the weight of the club head. If you can't feel the weight of the club head, you're too tight. The benefit of that drill is when you do it, you'll feel a real difference when you do that. Now the second drill I'd encourage you to do to, to help you realize how little pressure you need in your hands and your arms to hit the ball is just to do this. Don't even need a club, you spend hours doing this at home. Put your arms up to your side like so, shake the pressure out of your arms and then just let your arms drop. You could call that a gravity arm drop. There is no doubt in my mind you don't need any more pressure than that with your hands and arms when you're swinging the club down into the ball. And of course that's so different than most people. They get up here and the veins are popping out of the forearms and they're grabbing. And even if they manage to make contact, of course, it doesn't go very straight. When was the last time you took a close look at your posture? Don't underestimate the importance of good posture. The next thing you want to go to is posture. Bad posture is probably the biggest killer of most golf shots that I see on the tour. With myself, I know that when I play well, I'm standing very tall at the ball. Uh, when I play poorly, I slouch. In order to stand properly at the ball, you want to have your legs tall. Okay, stay, this is bad. Sitting like you're in a chair, that's very bad. It's going to cause bad swings. Again, being stiff-legged is bad also. That, that's no good either. So you want to find a happy medium, which is just slight flex with the knees. So you're not this way, you're not stiff, you're slightly flexed with the knees. And secondly, the upper body needs to be up. So rather than being slouched this way over the ball, you want to be up. And so your back is straight, your head is up, your shoulders are up, and so you feel like you're standing tall to the ball. And that allows you to have room to swing your shoulders underneath your chin and make a good swing. Now, Martin Hall has a couple of ways you can check your posture at home. Posture really has a big bearing on how far you hit the ball. Yes, that's right, how far you hit the ball. And let me show you that. I'm going to take a little leash, dog leash I've got here, and show you that when something rotates around an axis, it rotates at its fastest when it's rotating at 90 degrees to its axis. You can see that string is rotating at 90 degrees to my forearm. That's when it rotates its fastest, and just by coincidence, that's when it stays in the same plane as it swings up and down. 90 degrees to the axis. Now, why is that important? Well, let's look at the geometry of golf clubs. Now, it just so happens that most golf clubs are made with the shaft going into the head at an angle of about 60 degrees. Sometimes it's 62, sometimes it's 59, but for simplicity, we'll say 60 degrees. So stay with me on this one. If the angle of the club, the angle of the shaft going into the head is 60 degrees, how many degrees would I need to bend forwards to make a 90 degree angle? And of course, the answer is about 30 degrees. Now, biomechanics tells us that most tour pros have somewhere from between 28 to 30 degrees of bend forwards when they set up to the ball. And that's why, because it gives them a 90 degree angle between the shaft and the spine. That's putting the club and your body in the best possible position to produce speed and consistency when you swing. Now, that's the why of posture. Here's the how of posture. How do you get that 90 degrees bend? Most of the people that I see set up, the posture is really poor. As Tom demonstrated, they look something like this. The knees are bent, the chin's buried in the chest, not much good going on there. Well, 
We'll start with a drill, we'll call it the military address position, and here's how I'd like you to do it. You can actually do this without a club, you could do this at home. Standing as if you're on a parade ground where your hands would be behind your back, your shoulder blades would be pulled back, your chest would be pushed out, your chin would be up. Very straight, very erect position. And then you would bend at the hips from there, keeping your chin up, about that 30 degrees we talked about. Flex your knees just a fraction, and then let the arms hang. And they'll find their own position. That gives you the distance you should be standing from the golf ball. Now that's a very good posture. That's quite different from just sitting at the knees. Military dress position again. Chest out, bend, flex ever so slightly, let the arms hang. Now that puts you in a great posture position. You can get the same effect by doing this. Taking a club, putting it against your back, and it will touch you in three places. Should do. The bottom of the spine, the top of the spine, and your head. Those would be the three contact points. And then as you keep the club touching you in those three places, bend at the hips. This will feel a stretch in the hamstrings for a lot of you. Flex the knees just slightly, let the chin lower just a bit, and there's your ideal posture. Coincidentally, good posture gives you the right distance from the golf ball. I've heard it said, well, you need to stand further away from a driver than you do with a stand wedge. Well, just in case it had escaped your attention, most drivers are somewhat longer than sandwiches. As you'll see with this demonstration, whether I bend at the hips with a driver or do the same with a sand wedge, my posture is just about identical. The only reason that I appear to be standing close to the ball with a sand wedge is, of course, because the club is shorter. So no deliberate effort on your part to stand nearer or farther away from the ball, depending on what club you're using. Now, Tom will illustrate his technique for alignment and how to find your perfect ball position. Another real basic is target alignment, which really includes two things, I think. Number one is being stance, and number two is ball position. Uh, golf is a game of being target oriented. The reason you're out here is trying to hit the ball at a target every shot, whether it be a drive or a second shot or a putt, you're aiming for a target. So you need to stand aiming at the target with the right alignment. I have seen very few players ever who have been good players with a closed stance. Almost every player that I've ever seen who is any good at all has either been square or slightly open. I personally stand open. Uh, I set up with my feet and my hips and my shoulders left of the target. And then I kind of swing on an inside path, which allows me to stay inside the ball and draw it. I draw the ball, and so I really don't care that I'm set up open. That is, helps me get to the inside, to the outside, and put the right spin to draw the ball every time. And, and always remember one thing, is that a good golf swing is not one that looks good, it's one that repeats. And so if you can do the same thing every time, it's a good swing. And so for me, that means standing a little bit open, getting the club a little bit on the inside, and coming from the inside and hitting a draw. Ball position is of the utmost importance. Most tour pros that I see get into real bad problems because their ball position gets out of whack. If the ball gets too far forward in your stance, you have to move forward to get to it. If it gets too far back in your stance, you're getting too steep to get to it. And both cause bad shots. And so you need to find a spot in your swing where the path of your swing is flat. And by what, what I mean is, is, is in my golf swing, all I'm trying to do is to turn the club away this way and turn it through this way, staying steady. And if I can do that without swaying off the ball or moving forward, I just want to put the ball at the point in my swing where the swing is flat. And that's really about as simple as I can say to you. Is like if you can just make two turns without moving off the ball, Find the flat spot in your swing, that's where the ball goes. If you try that, I guarantee you'll improve your swing and your scores a lot. Okay, let's now review some of Tom's main points with the fundamentals. The grips are 
very, very individual. It's up to you, it's gotta fit your swing. But the one thing that you must do is have the right grip pressure. Most people that I see playing golf that play poorly choke the club. They get so much tension in their arms and shoulders because they just choke the club, they grip it so hard, there is so much tension and anxiety that they can't play. Having made about 10, 15 swings there, is turn the club the right way up and go ahead and swing. Bad posture is probably the biggest killer of most golf shots that I see on the tour. In order to stand properly at the ball, you want to have your legs tall, your slightly flexed at the knees. And secondly, the upper body needs to be up. You want to be up, so your back is straight, your head is up, your shoulders are up, and so you feel like you're standing tall to the ball. Obviously, one of the goals of this series is to help you lower your score. If you can consistently hit the fairway, it will help you reach that objective. How much better would your score be if you hit it down the middle? Everybody wants to hit the golf ball long, but length off the tee is no good without a necessary component, precision. The tour's best drivers have both accuracy and distance, a combination called total driving. With the rough that they try to get for us to play in out here, uh, you want to be in the fairway no matter what. Um, it, it, unfortunately for me, a lot of times when I miss the fairway, I'm just barely off, and that's where the thickest part is. So it's better for me to be back there hitting 160 yards than 130 yards in the rough. Uh, you can definitely control the ball a lot more off the short stuff. Take a cue from the pros. Most would rather have a six iron from the fairway than a wedge from the rough. It's a simple issue of control. And the good news is that you can play from a defensive stance. The best offense is defense. I defend myself from making a mistake on the first hole or on the first shot. If I could defend that bad drive, which is probably is the longest club in the bag, which is probably the hardest club to get the accuracy, that's why the fairways are much wider than the greens. Statistics are important, not only for the tour players, but also for the spectators as well. I go a lot by statistics because I think it really gives an overall view of, of who does the best a certain thing. I just think it's one of the uh, things that the public can relate to since it's kind of a, a statistical public, you know, with batting averages and field goal percentage points. I mean, every sport statistics mean something. The PGA Tour's driving statistics are measured in three ways. Distance, which is simply the length of the drive. Accuracy, which is the number of fairways hit. But the key stat is total driving, which tracks the distance and the accuracy of a player. Tom Lehman is ranked in the top 30 of this category for the past six years. I've got a question for you. What's more important, accuracy or distance? Well, the truth of the matter is, is they're both very important, but it doesn't matter how far you hit it if you can't find it. How does Tom Lehman control his drives? Well, it starts with the pre-shot routine. first thing that I think is very important is the pre-shot routine, which, which basically is visualization. When you see me staying behind a shot, looking down the fairway, I'm visualizing the shot. I'm seeing the shape of the shot. I'm seeing the spin on the shot. I'm seeing how it lands. I'm seeing how it rolls after it lands. I'm seeing the entire shot. And so pre-shot routine is seeing all of that, the spin, how close it goes to the whole, the whole nine yards, and there I hit a good shot. The second thing I really try to emphasize in accuracy and in consistency is tempo. And by tempo, I mean not changing speeds of the swing throughout the swing. Very often I catch myself and see other players doing something like taking it back real slow and then speeding up. Or they take it back too fast and then they slow down and they decelerate. Well, both times you've changed the speed of your swing throughout the swing. What you want is a consistent tempo, something that's very rhythmic, one, two, three. And it's some kind of thing that gets you feeling like you're just in a real slow, easy, smooth motion. There's no 
changes in energy, there's no changes in speed. So it's just a one, two, three type swing. And when you get that kind of thing going, you can hit a ball very, very straight. Again, Martin Hall with a couple of drills to keep your tempo in tune. Tempo. As Tom talked about, it is incredibly important to have good tempo when you play this game if you're going to play consistently. Tempo is the glue that holds all the pieces together. Important to realize in golf, golf is a game of motion, not positions. I've lined up six, seven, eight, nine balls in a row. And what I'm going to do to keep a constant rate of acceleration, to, to keep a constant tempo, a constant beat to the swing, is I'm going to swing back and forth and hit each one of these balls without stopping. So I'll start with the first one. You want, you want to make sure if you do this on the driving range, there's no one too nearby, because the first few times you do this, this is a little tricky. But by the time you get to about ball number five, when you're doing this, you get some feel of a constant, constant beat, constant tempo as you go through the swing. And then by the time you get to the last ball, that gives you some idea of the rate at which you should swing. Very sort of even paced. We call that drill the machine gun drill. You don't need to do it with a driver like I did. You can start with a seven iron. You can start with four balls off a tee. But it really helps put the tempo in there. Effort is the big killer. Effort ruins tempo. So what we do here is I'm going to have you whistle. I want a monotone whistle through the whole swing. Something like this. Should stay as one tone. Now, if you're exerting too much effort from the top, you'll have a little warble there. So ideally, if I can do it, ideally, here's what we'd have. There'd be very little change, if any. The next thing that's important, I think, is staying level. And by staying level, I mean that you're not going up and down throughout the shot. Very often, I catch players doing things like this, moving down and then up, or going up and then down. Okay, in both situations, you're moving so much that you ruin all your club head speed, you ruin all your balance, and, and you lose accuracy. So what I try to do is like my head stays very steady throughout the swing, so my head stays up, and I turn around my head, turn around my spine, so I stay very level. And Tom's final tip for better accuracy. The final thing is finishing with the belt buckle towards the target. Now, if you had a baseball in your hand and you were going to throw a pitch, you would never see a guy wind up, throw a pitch, and throw it like that, you know, with his body still facing towards the, the right field dugout. You would see a guy take the ball, throw, following through at the target. Well, his whole body ends up facing at the target. The same thing with golf. When I swing a golf club, but if I want to hit it straight, I need to finish with my buckle of my belt facing the target. And when I do that, the chances of hitting it in the fairway increase dramatically. Now, Martin has a drill for our members to help you finish facing the target. Now, members, one of the things Tom talked about so importantly was how to turn your belt buckle through to face the target. The A-frame drill just consists of having a shaft in the ground and a piece of string, and you just use it like a pulley. Now, as I set up here, I'll take my posture, bending at the hips that we mentioned earlier, and the backswing would just be a feeling. What the body should feel in the backswing is just, as I pull back with my right arm, my left side turns. Left shoulder gets near to the ball. The forward swing, I would pull back hard with my left side, and that, of course, is where you can see the right hip turn into the shot. So the A-frame drill, when done, looks this way. Little turn, big turn. You can see how the lower body really turns through there, and that certainly affects the speed that the club head goes at. Tom Lehman does this beautifully when he plays. That's one of the reasons why he's one of the best players on the PGA Tour. 
and you could learn a lot by learning to do this at home. It really trains the lower body how to get through the ball properly. Now let's review some of Tom's main points for better accuracy. When you see me staying behind a shot, looking down the fairway, I'm visualizing the shot. I'm seeing the shape of the shot. I'm seeing the spin on the shot. I'm seeing how it lands. I'm seeing how it rolls after it lands. I'm seeing the entire shot. What you want is a consistent tempo, something that's very rhythmic. One, two, three. It's some kind of thing that gets you feeling like you're just in a real slow, easy, smooth motion. There's no changes in energy. There's no changes in speed. So it's just a one, two, three type swing. If I want to hit it straight, I need to finish with my buckle of my belt facing the target. All right, now that we've got the ball going straighter, let's see about making it go farther. Everybody wants more distance, more power, longer drives. What is it about the long ball off the tee that people love so much? What is the fascination about the allure to power? Power is the chief attraction in the game of golf, and those who have it command attention. Since the game's beginnings, people have tried to emulate the raw power possessed by the stars on the PGA Tour. James Barnes was so long off the tee, they dubbed him Long Jim. He used that length to capture the first PGA Championship in 1916. Jimmy Thompson was a dominant force on the tour during the 20s and 30s. At six foot five, big George Bayer's powerful swing towered over the tour players in the 50s and 60s. And in a game where power reigned supreme, Arnold Palmer was the king. He drove the green at the par four first hole at Cherry Hills to capture the 1960 United States Open. Jack Nicklaus spanned the decades as a driving force on tour, along with Tom Weisskopf. Jim Dent marked his place in history as one of the longest bombers of the century. Nicknamed Big Jim, Dent continued driving the green even on the senior PGA Tour. Today's power drivers include the shark, Greg Norman, and Steve Jones. And of course, they don't call Freddie Couples boom boom for nothing. I have a 380 yard hole and it's, you know, the wind's blowing pretty good. You know, you drive it up next to the green and it's kind of fun to hit it that far, but uh, that doesn't happen very often. You know, you need to get right conditions. But, uh, of course, guys like Daly, they, they do it daily. At the Bell South Classic in 1995, John Daly not only drove the par 4 14th green, he came close to acing it. Why can Daly drive the ball further than the rest of us? What is his secret? There ain't no mechanics in it. It's, it's all natural. It's just, uh, I just generate a lot of club head speed. I don't know how, but I do. <laughs> Last year, John averaged 302 yards, but there are other tour players who drive with power. Davis is pretty tall, and he's got one of the, the largest swing arcs out there. His backswing, his arms, you know, they reach towards the sky pretty good. For the past five years, Davis Love III is ranked in the top five among driving leaders, but power does not always mean sheer distance. What is it about a star's swing that is so appealing? You know, Payne Stewart, Ernie Ells are probably the best rhythm, the best tempo. Uh, they make it look effortless. They can hit the ball a long way. It looks like they're barely even swinging the club, but yet they generate a lot of power. Oh, you know, if you look at someone, a tiger looks like he's, he's swinging pretty hard at the ball. He looks like he's trying to assault the golf ball when he hits it. 
Tiger Woods used his length off the tee to win six events in just nine months, including a record-breaking Masters. Known for his power and aggressiveness, Tiger used a driver to reach Pebble Beach's 18th green in two. Jack mentioned a guy 20, 25 years ago who was going to come out, hit it 30, 40 yards by the next longest guy, have an unbelievable mental attitude, and have a great short game. And he's here. His name's Tiger Woods. We all want more distance, right? In this segment, Tom and Morton will show how members can get a few more yards off the tee. Everybody wants more distance with their driver. These days, distance seems to be king. Tiger Woods, Ernie Els, Davis Love, Fred Couples, need I say any more? Well, I'll tell you one thing. Distance comes from club head speed. There's a lot of things that affect your club head speed. The first thing being the arc of your swing. When I talk about arc and club head speed, I'm meaning you got to get a big arc. Not a small arc where you just pick the club up and you're very narrow, but a big wide arc like this where the club travels a long distance from start to finish. You watch Davis Love hit the ball, you see a huge arc. The bigger your arc, the more club head speed you'll have. The second thing, I want to talk about is hitting the ball from the ground up versus the top down. What I see way too often is when you want to hit the ball, you're on a par five, it's reachable in two, you want to just nail this drive, you're going to swing out of your shoes and you get the top of your swing and the first thing you do is you swing it down with your arms and your hands and your shoulders. You just want to kill that ball from the top. While you do that, you're going to lose all your club head speed. The way really you have to do it is to swing from the ground up, meaning once you get to the top of your backswing, your, your feet, your knees, your hips start the downswing. So it's from the ground working up this way. The club follows, and as you turn out of the way, it's released through the ball with maximum club head speed. So you need to swing from the ground up. Another drill was inspired by the greatest of, of them all, almost Bobby Jones, when he said you should feel when you play golf as if you're swinging a rock on a string. Well, I haven't got a rock, but I've got a rope. And if, uh, if you go down to the hardware store and get a piece of rope about 30 inches long, 35 inches long, and you practice swinging that rope back and forth, you very quickly get the feel of how the swing starts from the ground up. You've heard Tom mention that, how the tip of the rope or the club head is the last thing to come through, and how the belt buckle, of course, faces the target. Now, you can see very clearly with the rope the rate at which you unwind will influence the speed at which the rope goes. I've had a lot of really good players tell me when they play their best, they feel as if they're swinging a rope. Worth trying at home, it'll help your game. The next thing is turning your left side out of the way. And uh, really what I mean by that is as you're coming down, you're starting from the ground down up and you're coming through the ball. If you continue just going to your left side this way, you get to a point where you'd be stuck and you can only flip your hands at the ball this way. At some point, the left side needs to clear out of the way. And so as you start your swing from the ground up, you get to a point where now you're at this position and you just need to let the club get to the ball and the left side goes out of the way. And as the left side goes out of the way, it creates kind of a whiplash effect. What I've done here is take my driver, could be any club, and I've just taken a piece of plastic, plastic rod, and put it down the grip end of the club. I'm going to turn to the camera to show you this now. As I set up the shaft, the extension rod is touching the left side of my body. I'm going to make a small back swing, and then a pretty aggressive forward swing keeping this touching my body. Now, because the club can't go past me, because the club can't do that, because this is in the way, the only other way I can get the club through is I have to turn the body. I've spent a lot of time hitting seven irons, eight irons with the shaft extension here, just hitting punch shots that way, so the shaft and the left arm still stay in line. When people don't turn through the ball, they get this look. And, of course, that would be out there. That'll give you hooks, and it'll give you a loss of distance. So more distance, 
that way. The last point I'd like to make is a swing within yourself. Now, that doesn't mean to not swing hard, because I firmly believe in swinging hard. What it means, though, is that you don't swing so hard that you lose your balance, you lose your rhythm, and you lose your whole sense of timing. You need to swing within yourself hard enough so that you can hit it a long ways, but within enough balance so that you're not out of control. So swinging within yourself means swing hard, but swing under control. All right, now let's review Tom's tips on more power off the tee. Distance comes from club head speed. There's a lot of things that affect your club head speed. The first thing being the arc of your swing. You watch Dave as Love hit the ball, you see a huge arc. Your feet, your knees, your hips start the downswing. So it's from the ground working up this way. The club follows, and as you turn out of the way, it's released through the ball with maximum club head speed. So you need to swing from the ground up. You need to swing within yourself hard enough so that you can hit it a long ways, but within enough balance so that you're not out of control. And in our final segment, Tom Lehman lays out his strategies to keep the wheels from falling off. If you're not driving well, say you're playing on whatever you're playing and you're just really struggling. Every time you take a swing, the driver is going off into the trees, off into the rough, in the bunkers, in the water. And how do you get yourself back on track? And when I think about that, the thing that I really key on is that I never ever try to change my swing in the middle of a round. Uh, I know how to drive the ball. I've hit plenty of drives in the fairway, and so no matter how I'm hitting the ball, I'm going to try to do the same thing every time. So if my swing thought is good tempo, it's going to stay good tempo. If it's you know, keeping the right arm in on the way through the ball, it's going to be that throughout the whole, my whole round of golf. So I never ever change my swing thought or my swing in the course of a round. I try to just to repeat the things that I know that I've done before. I want to be consistent with my swing thoughts, I want to be consistent with my swing, and therefore I don't change. I think change could be the biggest killer of people's golf swings. You hit one bad shot, you think, you know what, I've got to change completely. My swing is no good, it's not going to work, I better do something totally different. Well, that's not true. Stick with what has gotten you to the point where you are, work on that, and improve it. When I started playing golf, someone told me exactly what I've told you today. It was up to me to go out on the range and just figure it out for myself what works best for me. I would encourage you to do the same thing. You're never going to know what works best for you without going out there and just experimenting and doing it on your own for yourself. So get out there and get after it. Well, that about does it for this edition of the PGA Tour Partners Club Game Improvement Video Series. Now admit it, if you go out and work on these drills just once a week and play 18 holes once a week, you will lower your score. That's the goal of this entire series. Illustrate what the best players in the world do and then show you exactly how to do it. Now, excuse me, will I go out and...